Welcome students. We're just going to go over the assignment uh, briefly here, okay? Uh, the, the titles uh, are very telling. All right, so let's go ahead and go right, right into it. So we're covering the New England colonies on the first couple. Then we're doing uh, Colonial Pennsylvania and Colonial New Netherlands. All right, so the first one, right, is good court history. Uh, it is going to praise the Puritans. It's going to contend that they were ahead of their day, that they were progressive, right? And a lot of that is tied to the Protestant Reformation. And remember the Protestant Reformation of the 1500s, uh, the church was split uh, back in Europe uh, ideologically and institutionally and culturally and politically um, uh, by a movement that prided itself on being more Bible-centered and more uh, progressive, right? Uh, one of the things is they, they were against the uh, hierarchical nature of the church. They were against uh, the uh, clergy having a monopoly on, on reading and interpreting the Bible. Uh, they, were, uh, they differentiated, of course, on doctrine uh, as far as salvation, how one is, how one's soul is saved. Uh, they, that also led to uh, the seven apocryphal books uh, showing a difference between the Catholic and the Protestant Bible being thrown out by the Protestants uh, because the second book of Maccabees suggested a place uh, like purgatory um, that didn't fit in with their soteriology, with their belief in salvation, because they believed with Paul. Uh, this is simplistic and perhaps even unfair, but it's a bit like uh, St. Paul versus St. James. Uh, Paul saying that salvation is a gift that the Protestants clung to, and uh, James saying that it is faith plus works uh, that gets one to heaven, that the Catholic Church held on to in the Council of Trent. And so Martin Luther, uh, uh, John Calvin, a guy named Philip Melanchthon, and others are going to um, ideologically split from the Catholic Church, from the universal Catholic Church, and they're going to, uh, like I said, uh, curtail the number of books, take out the seven apocryphal books, contend that salvation with their own creeds, official creeds, uh, is by, by grace and through faith, and it's not of works and cannot be earned. Uh, that hence, there's no purgatory to work off sins. Uh, they also uh, were against the, uh, the, the, the Pope's authority, uh, contending that the, the Pope being a continuation of St. Peter, uh, by Jesus telling him, I, I give you the keys to the church and whatever you bound and loosen on, on, in, on earth shall be bound and loosened in heaven. Uh, the Catholic Church, through people like Arrhenius and others of the early church fathers, clung to the idea that because St. Peter was martyred in Rome, that he had the authority to give his key apostle um, position uh, to um, a, a successor. And so, at any rate, um, that uh, that was that was uh, rejected by the Protestants. Uh, they even went so far in their their rhetoric in claiming to be more egalitarian, and contending something called the priesthood of all believers. Uh, that the believer through the blood of Christ, I know this is a lot of religion, uh, can come to God on his or her own, can read the Bible for him or herself, um, and without the aid of a clergyman, much less a pope. And so um, they, they prided themselves, the, the English Puritans who wanted to purify the Anglican Church on being more uh, democratic, more egalitarian, more progressive, right? And so at any rate, uh, they contended that the Anglican Church was too Catholic. Uh, remember, Henry VIII had personal reasons for breaking away from the Catholic Church. They wouldn't annul his marriage with Catherine of Aragon. And so at any rate... Um, it, it stayed, it remained with, with the Articles of Faith, the, the, the 42 Articles uh, at one time went a little away from, uh, from Catholic doctrine, from Catholic liturgy, liturgy etc., under uh, Cranmer. Uh, and then it's going to go back to a Catholic direction under Queen Mary uh, and Archbishop William Loud. Uh, after her, L-A-U-D. And Archbishop Loud, he, he wasn't very tolerant of the Puritans who wanted to purify uh, the church, uh, nor of those who wanted to separate from the church, the separatists that the pilgrims will be known as in their generation. 
So at any rate, you do have evidence of, you look at Fox's book, book of Martyrs and so forth, you have evidence of Protestant and Catholic, uh, depending on whether it was Mary or Edward VI or Elizabeth or whomever was the, uh, the crown of England. Uh, it, it went back and forth to a, a Protestant to a more Catholic-like bent orientation, uh, the Anglican Church, that is. So it kind of found itself somewhat in the middle. Uh, to this day, the liturgy, uh, the acceptance of the apocryphal books, etc., are rather Catholic-like um, uh, to this day, like the Episcopalian Church, uh, its successor here in the United States. Uh, so at any rate, um, they are going to, uh, you know, the narrative we heard as kids, they're going to face persecution under Archbishop William Loud. Um, and they're going to move to the, uh, the separatists, that is, they're going to move to the Netherlands, uh, stay in a college town called uh, Leiden, and they're going to stay there just briefly, and they're going to move to, uh, they're going to land in Plymouth in 1620, uh, the separatists, right? They're going to be the ones who uh, are less controversial, I would say, uh, um, myself. Uh, subjectively. Uh, they went, uh, you know, from 1620 to 17 to 1675 uh, before they had a war uh, with the Native Americans, uh, Metacom's War, King Philip's War. So they went over 50 years with peace. Uh, they had the famous Thanksgiving with Massasui uh, and the Wampanoag Confederacy and the Poconockets. Uh, they're going to um, just, they're not going to be tied to the Salem Witch Trials uh, to the Pequot War uh, and other wars that are going to, um, uh, other things that are going to stain uh, to this day uh, the legacy of the Puritans uh, who were just above them in Boston, much larger in number, uh, much more controversial, had a war with the Pequo or the Pequots uh, within seven years of landing, uh, had the, the, the nasty mystic, Fort Mystic Massacre, uh, the Great Swamp Fight, uh, and of course the Salem witch trials. So at any rate, um, there's there's a difference, okay, between the Pilgrims and the Puritans. So we learn obviously more about the Pilgrims. Uh, we didn't learn though that uh, as children that there were there were some slaughters. There were some small scale slaughters. Uh, you could look up the Wessagusset raid. Um, that was a preemptive attack uh, against uh, I believe it was Massachusetts tribe enemies. Or, or, or possible enemies uh, off the advice of Massasoit, who contended that they were about to attack uh, Plymouth. Uh, you also had Plymouth uh, was given a, um, an ultimatum uh, to accept, to, to give homage to and pay tribute to uh, the Narragansett tribe. And they were, grant, they were given a, the sign of such uh, ultimatum uh, by way of uh, a snake filled with a snake skin filled with arrows and they uh, sent it back that same snake skin filled with gunpowder so they were not all just you know it wasn't all just um, equality uh, fraternity uh, and um, and co peaceful coexistence uh, also a little controversial as far as the contentions with the, the um, Plymouth as well is with all their Christian rhetoric, there was not hardly any uh, miscegenation, interethnic marriage and, and procreation. Uh, the, uh, the famous praying schools and the praying towns that were established uh, on, on a few different islands, uh, they were not very large in number. They didn't seem to try to convert that many natives. And not that that's a bad thing uh, to many different worldviews, but it didn't seem um, parallel with their, uh, their ideology, their worldview of trying to uh, bring about the millennial reign of Christ by spreading the gospel to the last corners of the earth and, and, and demonstrating for the world, as the Puritans contended above them, uh, a, a perfect Christian community, which of course did not happen. Um, so at any rate, you have the Pilgrims and the Puritans, so I'm going to use the term interchangeably, okay, uh, just uh, with New England. Uh, New England, as you see here, are all of the uh, states up, up here. Connecticut, Plymouth, uh, you have Rhode Island, Massachusetts Bay, New Hampshire, and before Connecticut or into the area of Connecticut was New Haven as well. 
and I'm not even including Maine yet. So at any rate, uh, New England, I use that as a generic term. On two occasions, at least two occasions, they formed a confederation uh, between one, one another. Uh, but if my memory serves me correctly, I don't believe Rhode Island joined the confederation uh, of their choice. Uh, so at any rate, going on here, New England as a generic term in that area, uh, the uh, schooling and literacy, you see here literacy rates, 70% for young men, 45% for young women. Uh, that was unheard of at that time period. Uh, the, the old diluter law mandated that villages of a certain size had to have a public school and had to have the children therein. And so uh, they were proud of that. They were proud of the congregational organization of their churches uh, in which uh, major decisions were democratically decided upon, including the pastor um, uh, being elected or, or you might say unelected or ousted. Um, in different positions uh, uh, that were underneath the pastor uh, were elected as well. And so, um, and then you also have the great, the Grand Council that initially was a, a governor. Uh, remember it was, they initially were private. They were private colonies, private companies uh, joined with joint stock strangers who were not part of the saints who claimed to have been born again and had to, and to have been saved their soul saved and, and, and heaven bound uh, by Jesus. And so at any rate, they made a deal with, with, with strangers, but they were very um, particular about church membership and the rights and, and your rights, your political participation uh, were intertwined with your church, uh, with your church status. Okay. So they did combine church and state. Um, so at any rate, um, you see, uh, arguably, that just look look for the details there, okay, of things that they did regulating the economy, regulating prices in, in progressive form and modern day pr progressive, literally progressive party form, um, uh, the democratic orientation of some of their institutions, uh, their education, uh, their scientific inquiry, uh, they created the Ivy League schools. Uh, all of those are included in number one's thesis. It's court history. It's choosing to praise them and see them as um, as exceptional, right? Uh, in in uh, paving the way uh, for American progress. Then with number two, of course, uh, it's going to take a 180. I want you to look for evidence of, of uh, as the the title implies, a very intolerant New England. So for one, uh, domestically, right? Uh, their church membership uh, was contingent upon very stringent rules of acceptance. And so a lot of people could not partake of communion in church. Uh, you were coerced, you were punished if you did not attend church, uh, even if you were not accepted as a full member. If you were not accepted as a full member, you could not participate in, in uh, politically in New England. And um, they're going to uh, eventually, uh, by the 1650s, by the next generation, they're going to relax their strict requirements, but not ideologically, but, but, but feeling coerced to do such because of the alleged immorality and worldliness of the second generation. Uh, by many primary and secondary source accounts, uh, the second generation was not nearly as spiritual, nearly as re religious as the first generation. Their children didn't follow suit, didn't take too kindly to the strict rules. Uh, Puritan culture uh, was, was very kind of unforgiving in the sense of, of um, what was expected of you. Uh, because the idea was, is they adhered to predestination from Jean Calvin. And, but the irony was, instead of just, you know, let life be and just see at the end when you die, whether you go to heaven or hell, it was anything but such. Uh, there, were, there was cultural and societal pressure uh, to confirm to yourself and to confirm to your peers that you were part of the elect. And if you were part of the elect, had truly been justified, gone from being a sinner condemned to hell to having your sins covered by the blood of Christ and being forgiven and go to heaven, then it, sh it ought to be um, evidenced by uh, sanctification. I know a lot of religion today. Uh, sanctification is, is becoming more Christ-like, becoming holier uh, and a, a, a better, holier Christian and person uh, as evidence that you are part of the, the saints, the elect 
who had been chosen to be forgiven. And so there was there were a lot of a, a lot of pressure. Also, the whole health and wealth prosperity theology that you find in some Protestant denominations, you find here uh, the evidence that that another uh, sort of proof, if you will, uh, uh, sign that God is with you and He's blessing you and that you're part of the elect was in Him blessing your vocation. And so, hence, if you become successful and wealthy, then that's evidence that God loves you, God approves of you, uh, and and has His hand on you in your life. So, at any rate, a lot of pressure uh, put upon Puritan children uh, to grow up rather quickly. Um, a very somber approach uh, for Protestant uh, denominations uh, by the Puritans. You were to, you, I think of like sinners in the hands of an angry God uh, by Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Edwards, I believe it was. Uh, just very kind of uh, fire and brimstone type preaching, right? That if you don't repent of your sins, uh, you don't have a prayer of being part of the elect. Um, and so uh, the whole idea of, of so much human effort being involved uh, tied to a soteriology, a study of salvation that contended that you can't earn it, that it's a free gift, is a little bit lost on me. Um, so at any rate, um, you have also intolerance with Native Americans. Uh, the, the, the Pequot War, uh, or Pequot War, uh, that, that could have been avoided by almost any source I've ever read. Um, there were Englishmen that were killed, including a Captain John Stone, uh, but they did not have a stellar reputation. They were not part of the saints. Uh, they were known in some cases for abducting and selling Native American children. And so, um, you know, there were cases where uh, uh, Plymouth uh, went out of its way to try to, to demonstrate to the Native Americans that they would have legal equality. That if Native Americans, um, you know, um, had a law uh, against murder, and an Englishman mar uh, murdered uh, a Native American, then that Englishman would be stand to justice, uh, Native American justice or English justice, uh, provided that they both, uh, that it, it, it met the requirements for Native American justice. And so at any rate, you had a guy with the last name Peach uh, who killed the Native American with eyewitnesses and the, the pilgrims put him to death. But with the, the Puritans, you see much more hubris you, you find evidence of much more arrogance. They had much greater numbers. They had fewer Native American tribes in their immediate vicinity of Boston. Um, and they had demands that they made uh, for, for tribes to pay tribute to them, to the Puritans. So the Puritans arguably played the, the role of the bully uh, much more than did the pilgrims beneath them. And so at any rate, the Pequot War uh, is, gonna have the, is gonna involve the Fort Mystic Massacre and that was just awful uh, as far as uh, people. They, they, they lit the, the village on fire, and whoever tried to escape from the fire was slaughtered. And there was no discrimination uh, between you know, men, women, children, uh, combatants, and non-combatants. And, so, uh, and then also proud, proud Miantonomi. Uh, Miantonomi was a, a sachem or a, a chief of the Narragansett tribe. He was trying to get the other tribes to uh, unite and push out the English. And he eventually, he was caught, um, and Uncas and uh, Uncas's brother uh, murdered him. And uh, in the Puritan sources, they said such was the proud, uh, such was the deserved, well-deserved fate of proud Miantonomi, as if he deserved that, and the Pur Puritans even had something to do with it. All right, and so, um, and then with uh, uh, King Philip's War, or that was his Christian name, or uh, Metacom was his native name. He was the second son of Matsusui, and uh, his, his elder brother, Alexander, um, uh, I, I'm sorry, his, his native name is eluding me at the moment, uh, but at any rate, I, I wanna say it was Wasamut, but at any rate, his elder brother uh, began going down a different turn from the father and he as well. They felt like the father, in, to, an ex, to an extent, was being a pushover uh, to the English, to the Christians. Uh, that he was allowing too much land to be encroached upon and to be purchased uh, by the English because it seemed, even according to the English sources in, in Plymouth and elsewhere, that there was an insatiable demand for land and they felt like it was going to lead to uh, lead to war eventually. And so Metacom, when he takes over from his elder brother, 
uh, he is going to make some demands uh, upon uh, Mass uh, upon Plymouth Colony, and he's basically going to be, according to the primary sources, laughed at and not taken seriously. So he's going to be begin uh, uh, attacks, and he's going to attack non-combatants as well. Uh, uh, you know, uh, cabins of families with children, etc. And so uh, the um, King Philip's War was bloody, and you see almost a, a, a tendency to engage in um, an indiscriminate warfare against any naval tribe. Because you can make the argument that the English and Spanish and other European colonizers, they divided and conquered rather effectively. Uh, they would fight against one tribe, but make sure that they were allied with, with one, two, three, or more other tribes in the process and not have to fight them all at once. And at this time, they began attacking even allied uh, tribal members. Uh, because simply because they were quote Indians, all right. And so you have a famous case in a, in a Naragan set uh, near a Naragan set swamp, uh, whereby the Naragan set left a uh, a piece of paper on a tree, uh, saying basic showing that they were allies and they were not supposed to have been attacked. And so you have that even from the Pilgrims in 1675. And of course they're going to literally uh, other uh, Native Americans. Are going to take the life who are allied obviously to the English are going to take the life of Philip of Metacom and bring his head back to Plymouth and the pilgrims are going to celebrate the pilgrims celebrated the first Thanksgiving after the Wessagusset raid uh, where they killed a few people they feigned diplomacy they literally were sitting down to eat and had them killed uh, you can read it in um, primary source accounts uh, like a Plymouth plantation, okay, and you could read it in secondary accounts like Nathaniel Philbrick's Mayflower, all right. So at any rate, you definitely have um, that side, and also uh, Anne Hutchinson, right, a woman who dared contend that some of the leaders of of uh, Massachusetts Bay Colony of the Puritans up in Boston uh, may have been part of the damned, the tares, when Jesus said that the angels will separate the wheat from the tares. The tares, I believe, if my theology is on, uh, representing those who pretend to be Christians, but they're not really uh, such, and, uh, and, and they, they, they end up going to hell. And so she contended that, some, that Satan had placed some uh, Puritan leaders in government positions and in church positions uh, to uh, to trick and deceive uh, the Puritan people. And that's where you get like a sense of almost hysteria uh, and paranoia in Puritan culture. And remember this this has been revised. People have, have you, you could see you could find books of saying like uh, Puritans at play, etc, right? That not all was just sobriety, sadness, worrying about heaven and hell, etc. that they, they played as well. They, they experienced levity. They encouraged uh, childhood to up to a certain extent for their kids, etc. But yet you do, as you find in number two, you find plenty of evidence of intolerance uh, within and uh, beyond uh, their own communities. So Anne Hutchinson is going to be excommunicated, uh, threatened to be killed, executed if she comes back. Uh, you had uh, Quakers trying to convert people to their denomination of Christianity. They were uh, expelled. Uh, some who came back were hanged, were actually killed. Uh, you had people guilty of sexual sins who were severely punished publicly uh, because uh, they, they, again, they, there, was a, um, there was a notion of the covenant. And the idea was, is like the Old Testament with the Hebrew people, uh, that they had made a covenant right through Abraham with, with, with Yahweh, with the Old Testament God, uh, contending that um, if they followed the Ten Commandments and followed God's provisions, God would bless them. He would bless their crops. He would bless them in, in war with their enemies. Uh, he would bless them uh, economically with prosperity. He would bless their health from disease, uh, etc., etc., right? And um, in a worldly way. And um, to the contrary, if people began sinning in the society, that God would punish the entire society uh, for it through uh, poor crops, 
uh, disease, warfare, etc. So hence you had select men that would come and spy on people in their own homes to see if you were living up to God's standards, to the Judeo-Christian Ten Commandments, Beatitudes of Jesus, uh, letters and the epistles written by Paul and Peter, etc., uh, to make sure that people were not sinning, uh, living in sin. So it, it, in some ways it was very allegedly intense, right? And then you had Roger Williams, who also made them look very kind of uh, intolerant. Roger Williams fought for the rights of Native Americans to their lands, that such lands needed the consent of the tribal leaders. They needed to have been bought um, uh, fair and squarely. And, um, and he also wanted a limited, uh, he wanted a separation of church and state. So they asked him to recant. Uh, repent is to change your behavior. Recant is to change your words. He refused to recant, and they excommunicated him as well and banished him, and he later uh, went and moved to uh, present-day Rhode Island and established, got uh, English permission to establish a colony there. One of the first things he did, supposedly using Puritan Massachusetts Bay Colony as his anti-model, was to declare religious toleration, all right, in Rhode Island. So something to think about. Then I have the Salem Witch Trials. Notice it's not a number, but it's just information, right? So two girls want to find out who they're going to marry. They do divination through Tituba, a Dahomey tribe uh, that practice voodoo, or vo the, the, the Vodun religion. And um, they used uh, egg whites in a jar, cast it under light, claimed to have seen the vision of a coffin, uh, began uh, acting very strangely, uh, having uh, kind of uh, uh, red, red splotches on their skin, feeling as if they were being uh, scratched and, and bitten uh, with di different types of pains, uh, muscle spasms, uh, bouts of hysteria, of just uh, cursing and, and screaming and yelling, uh, contending, and then it got really, uh, you know, um, theatrical uh, when it came to the actual trials uh, of the people coming from uh, Boston and from Salem Town over to Salem uh, Village uh, with the, the court of Oyer and Terminer uh, coming there to make decisions on this, right? Uh, on women who contended that they were bewitched by others. And you had Tituba and you had others contend that they signed the devil's book like Jesus has a book of life. Uh, with those who were going to go to heaven with their names written in it, that the devil had a book uh, to the contrary, and that they had signed their names in blood, uh, that uh, the devil appeared as in the form of a bird uh, and, and different animals at different times, and but that he used the specter, uh, the, the, the vision, the physical uh, appearance of a person, and that person's uh, specter to come and torment them. And my goodness, how in the world could you prove or not prove that, right? Uh, so people could contend, oh, I didn't torment this person. Uh, I was sleeping in my family's home with eight other people. They said, oh, no, but your specter did it. And they were willing to allow that type of, of uh, metaphysical evidence uh, to be admissible uh, in this court. And then you had uh, the incentive uh, to turn on other people. Uh, right in these trials, but there seems to have been no neat pattern. You know, at, 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 at there, there's a limited truth to the different theses that you probably have heard, uh, but no exact neat pattern. There are always exceptions to whatever pattern that they have concluded. So, for instance, uh, the um, the marginalized, uh, those who were not accepted, uh, seen as different, didn't seem to fit in, that they were scapegoated. There's some evidence of that, but it doesn't fit cleanly across the sheet. Um, uh, just the opposite, that it was envy, uh, that the marginalized were going after the more affluent and well-connected, because that happened in some cases. Uh, some go that direction. Some take the gender position and say, well, look, it was almost always women. And so the, the, they look at the, um, the, the patriarchal, uh, views of Puritan New England at that time and how they thought women were the weaker sex, 
uh, as they literally put in their writings. And I don't just mean physiologically that they believed, but that they believed that they were morally weaker as well and more likely to succumb to temptation and to be seduced by the devil and all of that. So it's a fascinating story, right? And so I'll put up a PowerPoint with some facts on that as well. Then now moving on to colonial Pennsylvania, uh, you're going to get praise on this first one, right, of William Penn. Uh, supposedly William Penn did a 180 uh, that in many cases uh, religion, as we've gone over in this class, has been um, targeted uh, uh, contemporarily uh, as an, an archaic intolerant force in history that has caused you know people to kill in the name of God uh, kill people's cultures like with the missions etc and 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 have them cease to be who they they had once been uh, culturally um, but in this case right it's contended that religion had a wonderful effect on William Penn it made him more tolerant it made him more compassionate and it made him more meek and remember the the Christian and Quaker notion of meekness uh, that is strength with gentleness and love. So whatever strength, whatever power that you have or are given, uh, you would certainly not abuse it, but you would be Christ-like in the manner in which you exuded that strength. So you find evidence, right, of him having almost despotic powers, uh, old palatinate uh, powers going from the medieval time period of being like the, the a feudal lord over manners in Pennsylvania. But he is going to share power with an elected legislator. Uh, he's going to keep the power of veto, uh, but only uses it twice. And in at least one of the two occasions, it was to defend the Native Americans. Uh, so he didn't seem to have abused his power uh, politically. Economically, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, and Massachusetts Bay uh, developed the largest numerical middle class, arguably, uh, in all of English colonies, colonial North America. Uh, so you had a, a myriad of jobs and trades uh, that opened up. He went out of his way uh, to, 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 um, to offer land to the marginalized back in Europe, uh, not just WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, but he went, had people sent to Bavaria and other parts of the German 39 states, uh, into the Czech Republic, uh, into uh, Flanders or Belgium and these other countries as well uh, and trying to get uh, those who were not well to do. Uh, so this is the opposite of might say like Governor William Lord Barclay uh, in Virginia trying to get wealthy gentrymen to move over to Virginia. He's trying to get the marginalized of Europe to have a chance in Pennsylvania. Uh, the line of credit, the availability of affordable land uh, the safety net issues they had, like the famous almshouses for the homeless, uh, supposedly numerically, uh, supposedly the amount of resources put behind them and, and charitable contributions, uh, are there's, you won't find the likes thereof in any of the other colonies. So William Penn, court history has, has survived the storm of revisionist attacks uh, relatively well compared to that of other colonies and other colonial leaders, as you might as you might see on this number. So this number is trying to make a heroic saint of William Penn, a man who did not have to share these powers, share offer these opportunities to so many people who probably wouldn't have had such opportunities back in Europe in the old world, uh, but chose to do so because of his religious conversion. Okay. Nevertheless, this guy was a speculator to his final days, trying to buy something cheaply and sell it at a higher price. Uh, he had an inner uh, club or inner clique, if you will, uh, that had some of the best lands in Philadelphia uh, that, that were in on the fur trade and, and knew secrets and were in on uh, you know, uh, financial deals that were not even made known, much less accessible. Uh, to the general public. So it wasn't just that saint. He was more complex than that. And then also uh, the Native Americans called him uh, the quill pen because uh, they contended every time they saw him he had a pen in his hand and was trying to coax them into selling more of their land to him and to his colony because he was almost always 
um, trying to get uh, purchasers uh, to buy more and more land from him. And he had the right to, to collect quitrants or rent payments from all landowners, not just renters uh, as well. So he made money, okay, although he didn't collect on the quitrants. Uh, he made money. Um, he had an inner circle. He put pressure upon Native Americans. Uh, he did nothing when some of the tribes, uh, like the Cheyenne, uh, um, are going to um, sell most of their own lands and try to um, uh, en engage, take advantage of the middleman position of providing pr uh, goods and services from one community to the next that they know are highly coveted. Well, in the short run, that's great, right? But in the long run, they have no lands now. And there's evidence that he didn't stay up at night worrying about that. And he had reason to know, to foresee, that that, that decision by some of the tribes around Pennsylvania would not be in their best interest. And he didn't stop them from selling that land. So hence I say he was a puzzle. He was an enigma. He was not just simply a saintly figure. Uh, always altruistically looking out for the, the betterment of his fellow man. Okay? So something to think about. Uh, and then lastly, toleration in colonial New Netherlands. So New York, basically, right? Uh, the, the Dutch came in there first. Um, um, and in doing such, they're going to, um, uh, under the Dutch West India Company, they're going to have a rather um, polyglot population a population of, of many different ethnicities and, and, and languages and religions and cultures and, uh, and nationalities, and they're going to be proud of that to an extent. And you can find evidence of this, right, when you look at the Netherlands itself. Uh, you could make the argument that the Netherlands made Span Spain as an anti-model, uh, and hence they, they did not want to be like Spain who instituted the Spanish Inquisition on them in the Netherlands, trying to, to keep them colonized. And so when they broke free, uh, they established a, a national church, the uh, Zwingli's uh, Reformed Church, the Dutch Reformed Church, but they, they tolerated other religions and churches, etc. Uh, so when you look at Amsterdam itself, you look at Leiden, the college town, and, uh, and other places, I believe Antwerp, uh, you're going to find uh, more toleration there, back in their home country. But nevertheless, uh, the Hague, uh, the leaders back in Netherlands itself, gave a lot of latitude to the Dutch West India Company and in having the New Netherlands, and they're going to allow Jewish community to spring up, a Quaker community to spring up, uh, Italians, Poles, Lithuanians, and others are going to come there. At one time, uh, Father Jog uh, is going to walk through Manhattan Island in New York and contend that he heard no fewer than 16 different languages just in minutes. Um, so at any rate, um, perhaps I'm being too harsh on the Dutch here, but I'm making a, an argumentative point that, that that toleration did not come from an egalitarian, uh, progressive place. But instead, right, you find in cases with the Quakers, with the Jewish community, etc., whereby they're going to contend that they're allowing that subgroup, uh, they're tolerating that subgroup uh, to exist, uh, to practice their own religion, etc., simply because they are participating in and contributing to uh, the Dutch West India Company's uh, profitability uh, in that region, namely the fur trade, for instance, uh, and other uh, types of trade that were going on in New Amsterdam, in New York City. So you find that you have a, um, uh, the um, new f uh, half freedom granted to African Americans, whereby they could uh, purchase their own freedom, but they had to uh, move to, ser to serve as kind of a, a buffer in a buffer zone uh, between them and the Iroquois and other tribes that they were threatened by and had tenuous relationships with because they had war. They had a guy named William Kieft uh, who had a war uh, with the Native Americans in some cases uh, begun over something as silly as a hog. Um, but at any rate, um, maybe I'm being too hard on the Dutch here 
maybe there you could find uh, just getting online briefly uh, plenty of evidence of, of the Netherlands being very ahead of its time in its toleration. But in this number, it's more cynical, right? Look for evidence that that toleration was just that. They put up with them, they tolerated them, but that's that. They didn't think of them as equals, they didn't fully embrace them socially, etc. but that there was an economic reason, an economic motive for tolerating uh, these diverse uh, demographics in Dutch New Netherlands, in, in Dutch New York, okay? So something to think about. Uh, you also had a guy named uh, uh, the, the Turk Van Sally, right? Anthony Van Sally, and they called him the Black Turk. And look up evidence on him. Uh, he was getting in trouble quite often, and you have quotes from them contending, uh, kind of adhering to old stereotypes against African people that he lacks, though we talked about it in the southern colonies, that he lacks self-control, that he's violent, um, etc., right? That, that he's sexually promiscuous, etc. But, but we'll tolerate him because he's helping out uh, the, the Dutch West India Company. He's helping contribute wealth to the colony, okay? So that's what you need to know for the assignment, whichever one you choose, and that's what you need to know for the test because something on nearly all of these will be on test number one, okay? So I hope to see you tomorrow going over test number one, and I hope this video helps you complete um, assignment number four, all right? So have a good day, and take care. Bye-bye.